information. We're very ex we're very excited about the presenters we have today and a lot of great information. Uh, I'm Amy Hodges. I'm a principal or quality planner with the North Central Texas Council of Governments and part of the Dallas-Fort Worth Clean Cities Coalition that's hosted within the Council of Governments. Uh, Lori Clark is our Clean Cities Coordinator. We are a local Clean Cities Coalition that's part of the nationwide Department of Energy's Clean Cities Program, and we partner with public and private fleets to reduce their energy impact and increase fleet efficiency. If you go to the next slide, we'll just take a quick look at today's agenda. Uh, Jared Wright and Savannah Nance, who are also air quality planners here with Council of Governments and with Dallas-Fort Worth Clean Cities. And I will start things off with a brief overview of air quality and electric vehicles. Then we'll have Lone Star Specialty Vehicles, uh, Peterbilt, Ford, Lion Electric, and Exos. Um, we'll hear those, their presentations uh, on their electric products. Uh, we'll let each presenter decide if they want to address questions as they come up during their presentations or if they have allowed allotted time uh, for questions toward the end of their, their 15 minutes. Um, but of course, feel free to put your questions in the chat. Next slide. This week is National Drive Electric Week. It started last Saturday and it ends this Sunday, October 3rd. And every year the council governments in Dallas-Fort Worth Clean Cities um, host National Drive Electric Week for our region. Um, we, this is one of our biggest activities we do each year um, under our Electric Vehicles North Texas Initiative. And we have planned a full week of events. Uh, some events are geared toward fleets and others are just for everyone. Uh, I believe Encore has an electric vehicle road rally going on all week and they will announce uh, who won that. I think it was a photo scavenger hunt kind of thing. They'll uh, announce the winner of that um, Sunday at our big event, which I'll talk about here in a second. Uh, but today's webinar on electric trucks is our first uh, webinar event of the week. And we're following that with another webinar tomorrow on leveraging EV uh, charging infrastructure to make your community a destination. Friday, we'll have another webinar on the benefits of workplace electric vehicle charging. And then to close out the week, Sunday, we have our main event. It will be held at the Wreck of Grapevine from 4 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. And this is where we showcase all makes and models of EVs. I believe we've got 20 different EVs, uh, EV models that will be there. Uh, we usually have, oh gosh, um, over a hundred vehicles uh, for people to just walk around uh, that are on display. It gives folks the opportunity uh, to visit with the EV owners and chat them up. And uh, then there'll also be vendors there as well. Um, and we'll actually have one electric school bus there. Um, ride and drives will be offered by eCara and iDrive One motor cars uh, at the event. Uh, and then towards the end of the evening, we'll have an EV related out outdoor film screening uh, there'll also be food trucks and an ice cream stand, so it should be a lot of fun. Um, so we invite you all to um, go to our website, register for the event. Um, the URL is driveelectricdfw.org, or you can also go to the Dallas-Fort Worth Clean Cities event page and register. And if you have an EV, bring it uh, and be part of the display in the EV parking lot. Okay, so I'm going to turn it over uh, to Amy. Savannah and Nance. Yes. I'm, I'm sorry if I could jump in just for a second. Hi, everybody. Um, this is a little bit of an embarrassing ask, but related to that uh, film screening that Amy just mentioned that we plan to host at the end of the night, we actually still need film screening equipment. We are missing a sponsor to support that particular item. Um, so we have a vendor, we have a quote. Um, if anybody would be willing, we, we are unable to pay for entertainment expenses as an agency so we aren't otherwise we would just do this ourselves but if if anybody happens to be um, interested in being recognized as a sponsor of this event and would be willing <laughs> to help us out with that screening equipment um, I will pop my email into the chat if you could connect with me offline that would be great apologies Amy carry on oh perfectly okay um, okay so I'm going to turn it over to Savannah Nance Okay, thanks, Amy. 
So we just wanted to quickly cover on why we work on reducing emissions from transportation. So we currently have 10 counties in our region that are not meeting the federal standard for ozone and nitrogen oxides or NOx is a contributor to the ozone problem. So as you can see on the screen, um, mobile sources or transportation contributes to two thirds of the NOx produced in our region. On road is the majority of this. What we really want everyone to understand is that if we electrified all medium and heavy duty vehicles, we could actually reduce the NOx produced in our region by 20%, um, just by electrifying that very small portion of vehicles. Next slide, please. So we were gonna quickly cover the benefits of EVs or electric vehicles. As we just discussed, EVs are going to help with our air quality because they are zero or low emission vehicles. EVs are cost less to maintain, so you save money. Electricity is more affordable and is a more consistent price than diesel or gasoline. Electricity is considered more secure because it's from can be produced from different energy sources. And EVs are high performing vehicles. They provide instant torque and they're fun to drive. Next slide, please. And now that we've covered some of the benefits of EVs, we did wanna talk about how you can calculate some of these benefits or how we can calculate them for you using our alternative fuel life cycle, environmental and economic transportation tool or a fleet. So this tool was developed by Argonne National Lab. Um, there's two versions of it that we recommend that you check out. One is A-Fleet Online, which is very quick and easy to use. And then the other one is the A-Fleet Spreadsheet Tool. This one's a little more comprehensive. You can get a lot of results and you can really customize it to show results for your fleet. We decided to run an example to show to you guys. And for the example, we're gonna compare a diesel refuge truck and an electric refuge truck, but you can compare almost any vehicle in A-Fleet. At the bottom of the slide, you can see the inputs that we used for our comparison. Um, so the cost, the maintenance and repair, the fuel economy. We just use the defaults that come in a fleet, but all of these can be customized um, so it more reflects your fleet. One thing that I did want to point out is that we run these comparisons assuming that you will own the vehicle for 15 years. And so if you're Fleet tends to replace your vehicles more often or less often than that. Um, you should definitely take that into consideration because it'll make a considerable difference in the results. Next slide, please. So this is going to be the lifetime air pollutants, assuming that 15 year ownership of a diesel refuse truck and an electric refuse truck. What we really want to highlight is that NOx number that is significant. I mean, completely higher than the EV because EVs don't produce any tailpipe emissions. The only emissions coming from the EV are going to be the particulate matter. Um, most of that which will come from the tires. Next slide, please. And then this is probably what we consider to be one of the most useful things you can get from a fleet, which is the total cost of ownership. So total cost of ownership is going to be everything that goes into paying for the vehicle over the 15 years that you own it. So depreciation, license and registration, everything. You can see on the right, the EV bar is lower than the diesel. This is because of the savings that you will get from a maintenance, the maintenance and repair costs and the fuel costs. So a fleet is estimating a about $500,000 in savings and maintenance and repair by operating an EV over the 15 year lifespan and saving about $350,000 on fuel over the 15 year lifespan. So these are just two graphs that we can um, pull for you, but there's many, many graphs that can be um, calculated from a fleet, probably anything you could be interested in, it's in there. So if you're interested, please reach out and we can either help you learn how to use it or we can run that information for you and you can use these graphs however you like. And I, next slide. I'm gonna hand it off to Jared Wright and he's gonna talk about EV charging infrastructure. Yeah, thanks Savannah. So we just wanted to highlight really quick the types of EV charging for y'all. So as y'all may know, there's level one, level two and DC fast charging. 
Now, level one charging may take a little bit too long for fleets, especially if you're getting a larger heavy duty vehicle with a larger battery pack. So level two and DC fast charging will be most applicable for uh, fleet use. And level two charging will have a cheaper installation cost and we'll use a standard 220 volt outlet. Whereas DC fast charging may be more ideal for vehicles that are in use constantly or who, that you need to charge quickly. And that will use a 480 volt outlet and we'll have higher installation costs and need a three phase power installation. And we also wanna quickly go over other charging technologies. We did have an entire webinar on EVSC charging with several presentations from various EVSC manufacturers back in June. So that's on the DFWCC website, if y'all would like to go check that out. But quickly, there's some storage charging. There's also mobile charging options, as well as solar charging is available for EVs. And again, there's also networked and non-network charging that we covered in our EVSC webinar. But basically, a network charger will give you additional features like smart demand response or summary reports and some payment options at the cost of an additional subscription fee. And here we want to highlight the steps to bring EVSC to your property. So the first step is to engage your electric utility early. Encore has told us they would like at least 18 months lead time before installing any EVSC equipment. And we also have some uh, utility contacts in the region after this slide, which um, when we distribute the slides, y'all can use those if you would like to reach out to start planning your EVSC installation. And step two here is to determine funding, installation, and operational costs. So beyond the cost of just the charger and the conduit itself, there may also be some permitting costs and then also operational costs, you know, subscription fees with the charger, like I mentioned earlier, if it's networked. And then for step three here, we want to make sure you are aware to ensure visibility and promote. So promote would only apply if it's available for the public, but even if it's just for fleet use, you still wanna make sure the charger is visible and have signage and paint on the ground to make sure this is designated as an EV charging spot and you don't have conventional vehicles parking there, taking up the spot when you need to be charging. And so here are those utility contacts I mentioned earlier. We'll be sending out the slides to everyone who attended, so you will have these. We also wanna go over some electric vehicle and infrastructure funding options. Right now at the North Central Texas Council of Governments, we have Clean Feeds North Texas open. The deadline is October 8th, so very soon, and we have about $109,000 left to fund on-road and non-road diesel replacements. So this will fund 45% uh, of the new vehicle cost if the replacement is electric, 35% if it's carb low NOx certified, and 25% for all others. We also have the North Texas Clean Diesel Projects opening in mid-October, so very soon. This will be similar to Clean Feeds North Texas, similar funding amounts at 45, 35, and 25%. It'll also fund engine replacements and it will also doesn't have an older limit. So it doesn't matter how old the vehicle is, it is eligible to re be replaced. And if the vehicle is being replaced by electric, it doesn't matter how new the replacement vehicle is. And you can find all these opportunities on nctgog.org slash AQ funding. And we can also sign up for email updates to find um, funding announcements or webinars and workshops on funding opportunities. And then last there on the vehicle side is TERP, which has started the new biennium. And so we expect their light duty rebate to open anytime now. And then here for infrastructure, we have the Volkswagen DC fast charging and hydrogen rebate, which should be opening very soon. That will fund up to 70% for public use or 60% for workplace or multi-unit dwelling. And will also fund 33% um, of hydrogen infrastructure available to the public. And then TERP also has the alternative fueling facilities program opening soon. Here, we just want to quickly show you all uh, where the industry is heading. These are electrification transition goals of several large OEMs. So I'm not gonna go through this all in detail, but you can see by 2030, most OEMs will be 30 to 40% electrified with some caveats for hybrid or only new vehicles. And then by 2040 to 2050, several of them will be carbon neutral as well. We also want to quickly highlight the run on less program. The North American Council for Freight Efficiency and Rocky Mountain Institute conducted an electric technology demo. They had 13 fleets with 13 different electric vehicles ranging from like step vans to box trucks to larger tractors. And so they ran these vehicles for about 18 days. And you can see some of the data collected here over across all vehicles. They traveled about 7,000 miles, made almost 1,700 deliveries, and in total saved almost 12 tons of CO2. 
to can view all this uh, stats in detail and per fleet over on that URL there and see end views from the operators. And lastly here are just some resources we have. We did want to highlight the AFDC vehicle search and the drive to zero zero emission technology inventory. These are both uh, vehicle search tools to see um, not only electric vehicles, but the AFDC will have alternate fuel vehicles and drive to zero will let you see electric vehicles all the way until uh, 2023. And here again is our AQ funding page. And at the bottom is the Encore has a new commercial electric vehicle page where you can find some resources as well. So here's our contact information if you all have any questions. And then from here, I'll hand it on to Chaz from Lone Star Specialty Vehicles. Hey, thanks, Jared. I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. And uh, if uh, folks have not had the chance to check out that run on less, as you had mentioned, that was a great project that that NACV had put on. And uh, we were actually part of that. Um, very grateful for you folks to have us on today and for NACV for uh, having us participate in that. There's a lot of really helpful data um, on the run on less website. And uh, I think there's going to be more to come in the next couple of months um, that they're going to follow up on. So with that, um, uh, I'm Chaz Mies. With Lone Star, some of the vehicles that we had in there with our uh, custom wrap um, that got quite a bit of attention with the reflective lightning bolts. If, if anyone was able to be at the show, uh, it was a pretty neat truck, and we were really happy to get out and about again um, after a couple of years off. So here's the overview, and just for sake of time, um, we'll just kind of jump right in. Uh, for those of you not familiar with our company, um, we are part of TNTX Truck, which is a Daimler Trucks North America uh, dealership. We have 24 full dealership uh, locations, um, and you can see where those are located. Um, we have Lone Star Truck Group facilities along with Tag Truck Centers. And uh, we are the second largest footprint in North America and just shy of a billion dollars in revenue. Lone Star Specialty Vehicles has been around since 2014. We got into the industry building diesel trucks, uh, glider kits, and and diesel that the opportunity uh, for EVs was coming. And through our partnership with Dana, um, and the acquisitions that they had made over the last couple of years. Uh, we decided in 2019 to start working with them on a electric offering. Uh, we started in the spring of 2019 and delivered the first fully ever electric tandem terminal tractor to HEB in San Antonio. They ran that truck for approximately six months so that we could validate, uh, make sure we had the best truck available after that time Obviously, like most folks, 2020 ended up being more of a year of validation rather than production as expected for us. But through that time, we were able to get multiple FMVSS certifications completed and further uh, production validation on our vehicle. We're full production right now. Um, it's been a very busy year, which is great. Um, we had a couple large fleet orders uh, that sold us out for the rest of the rest of this year. Um, we're currently taking orders for next year and have already secured uh, enough units to double production for next year. Um, so I think 2022 uh, for us and for the industry um, is going to continue to get very busy. So when we look at electrification motivators, um, as, as we talk to customers, and I'm sure the other OEMs see this as well, this pyramid could look a little bit different, but at the end of the day, most customers, TCO uh, is king, and this has to make uh, financial sense and economic sense. And uh, in this application, it surely does. Um, and that's without incentives. Uh, when incentives are there, this is an absolute slam dunk. Otherwise, it could be corporate sustainability goals driving this decision or state, uh, local, federal regulations driving that. So when we talk about TCO um, and, and a truck in this application, you know, this is measured in hours and not on miles. So if we look at the variables in, in a certain application where this truck is gonna run 16 hours a day, 350 days a year, that's 5,600 hours. The maintenance cost per hour, this is assuming a tier four emissions uh, vehicle. 
uh, comparing it to a diesel. Which had uh, um, four DPS. Chaz, Chaz, I'm sorry, this is Lori from North Central Texas COG. Um, you've frozen up on us a few times. Um, okay. I think it's just been, I don't think we've missed much, but um, it, we, I believe we have your slides. Um, if we share okay. them for you. Uh, yeah. And I don't, I don't know if you want to kill your camera in case that may help as well. Yep, I'll kill it. It might be my Canadian connection. <laughs> I'll right. hold my tongue on the joke there. <laughs> <laughs> um, so here's here's the operational cost that I was referring to with with measuring total cost of ownership. So um, the maintenance cost per hour on these vehicles when there is tier four emissions equipment is is much higher than than pre emissions. Um, and in most cases, the diesel fuel price is, is more costly because these trucks aren't out on the road. They're domiciled at a distribution center or a depot. So they're having to bring fuel on site. Um, this was uh, specific for a customer um, that we're working with and just completed a demo for um, with their data um, with that they do have fuel dropped on site. So you can see from a from a daily basis, um, you know the cost of of running a diesel unit versus electric. Um, it's you know ten times more expensive um, to run a diesel in this application than an electric, and the maintenance costs are you know roughly a third. So even without incentives, you know we're looking at less than a three year payback on this vehicle, um, and then after that, uh, we're we're looking at nothing but savings at that point. Next slide, please. This is a standard specification. Um, next year, we're actually gonna be moving to our S22 model as the only um, offering on the on this terminal tractor because it's it's been our most popular by far. And with the, the price difference um, and getting the double, uh, basically the double the battery capacity, it just makes more financial sense for our customers as well. So. Each of these vehicles has 220 kilowatt hours of. Of battery storage, we can charge at 106 in less than two hours and where that really comes into play is on shift changes, lunch breaks, um, things like that. So if an operator gets a 30 minute lunch break, they can recoup recuperate quite a bit of state of charge. Um, and keep that truck running continuously throughout the day. Um, the big difference, like Savannah had said, um, driving an EV versus a diesel, um, as I do these visits like I am this week, the first thing that's noticed right away is the instantaneous torque and horsepower on these vehicles. Um, this truck has 1,300 more foot-pounds of torque than, a, than its diesel equivalent. Next slide, please. So the major components in this truck, um, we order everything through Dana, which from a fleet perspective, um, me being a prior fleet manager um, is a major benefit. Um, you have one point of contact from a, a warranty filing perspective, uh, one software to use, and uh, one uh, kind of contact for troubleshooting, diagnostics, and training. The Sumo MD motor that you see at the top left it's a mass produced motor that line of the sumo series there's over 14,000 of those that's been commercially produced the component in the middle we call that the cradle and that's where all the high voltage components um, run through and uh, there's other components in there such as the inverter to run our hydraulic pump and motor um, as well as our inverter to run that sumo md motor as well of course if you're going to go with dana um, they're well known for axles, so we're definitely run and drive and steer axles on, on our trucks as well. Next slide, please. This is our team. So if you'd like to reach out to us, um, please feel free. Um, all our emails are there and phone numbers. So if, uh, if you're in the area, um, you know, please give us a call. If it's something of interest, we actually have had some um, interest in different applications that we didn't think would come about. Um, actually, uh, someone reached out to me from our last call where a fire department is interested in looking at this type of vehicle to set up a blockade or a barrier after an accident. 
So some of the city and, and government officials that may be on this call, maybe something to think about about for your fire departments as, as well, something kind of more forward thinking than we're used to than uh, your average distribution, distribution center or uh, port application. So with that, that's the end of, my com uh, end of my presentation and I'll open it up to any questions that anyone may have. I have, a, I have a question, Chas. This is Lori. Um, that that idea that you mentioned there at the end about using, well, you froze up again for a second. So I think you were saying using one of the chassis as a as a barricade for emergency response situations instead of having to use a fire truck. Could you um, clarify that? And then if you have any cities that are already doing that, would you be able to drop their names into the chat? Yes. So um, what they were looking at is after an accident, rather than using a, a million dollar fire truck to block off two lanes of traffic, they're looking at a trailer that has uh, barrels and it's a uh, basically a lane blockade or a lane barrier. And our vehicle would be used to pull that uh, trailer to the scene of the accident and block off that area so that um, no vehicles can enter those lanes and, and have a further accident. Um, the city of Carrollton, I believe, was the um, city that reached out to me, and we've been working with them on getting them pricing and specifications for that vehicle. Excellent. Thank you. Any other questions for Chaz? We have a couple of minutes for Lone Star, so feel free to chat a question or just go ahead and unmute yourself and speak up. Okay, well, thank you, Chaz. Uh, that was that was a great presentation. Great information. Yep, thank, thank you all. Sorry for the for the freezing up sometimes when I'm on this crazy. Absolutely. And you just froze again, <laughs> ironically. The travel schedule. <laughs> I'm trying right. to find an office and see. All right. Take care. Understand. Thanks. Bye. Okay. Uh, Dusty, go ahead. All right. Good afternoon. Can everybody hear me okay? Yes. All right. Great. All right. So my name is Dusty Garland with Peterbilt Motors. And I'd like to thank NCT COG and, and all of you for allowing me the chance to speak about Peterbilt's electric trucks. Next slide, please. There we go. Uh, I do want to remind everybody the vehicles I'll cover today, our three electric models, are in production and being shipped in 2021. Uh, so on this slide are two examples of that. We've got a 220 EV that has been in operations in Anchorage, Alaska since June, and a Model 520 EV that went into operations in Boise, Idaho this summer as well. So both customers have been really pleased with the performance of the Peterbilt EVs and have more of those on order. Uh, and then in addition to that, we've got several cities you know, around the country that have placed orders as well and are planning on deploying uh, later this year or early 2022. Next slide, please. So Peterbilt has three uh, electric vehicle models available, including a 579 EV, so our over the road or short haul and drainage application model, the 520 EV, perfect for refuse applications, and the 220 EV for local and last mile delivery. All three of these uh, are available for order, and I'll cover each one in detail in a little more technical details on the upcoming slides. Next slide, please. So starting with the 579 EV, this truck features a Meritor e-axle design in a six by four configuration and is rated for up to 80,000 pounds. Uh, really on interstate and highway, we'd be talking 82,000 since there is a, uh, an allowance there for electric vehicles. The 396 kilowatt hour batteries can operate up to 150 miles. And like the other models, 
uh, that Peterbilt has, all of them use iron phosphate as opposed to nickel-based chemistries in their batteries. And the reason I mention that is because in comparison, iron phosphate chemistries support a much higher number of charge cycles. So it eliminates the need to replace the batteries before the truck. We do plan on our batteries lasting the life of the vehicle itself. And then all our batteries are thermally managed to operate in hot or cold temperatures. And the 579 EV can be charged from empty to full in less than four hours. Next slide, please. The 520 EV, also a class eight, features a similar powertrain with 6,000 pound gross weight rating. Uh, it's available in front, rear, and side loader configurations. It can achieve 80 to 100 miles of range or about 1,100 bin cycles using the same battery size as the 579 EV. Uh, in the refuse application, the generative braking really shines. So this allows for single pedal operation and extending the range as well. And it's had that feature has received very positive feedback from drivers of our early adopters. Next slide, please. So lastly, the Model 220 EV features a Dana midship powertrain and comes in several configurations. So it can be specced as a class six, non-CDL or a class seven. Uh, it can accommodate 24, 26, or a 30-inch box, uh, excuse me, 30-foot box, and it's available in three different battery sizes. So it can do 100, 150, or 200-mile range, really depending there on the customer's application and needs, uh, because we do have to remember with range comes weight, and so we're balancing that for our customer. And then DC fast charging can have the batteries back to full in as little as one and a half hours. So all of our EVs feature CCS1 charge ports, so they're compatible with a wide array of charging options. Next slide, please. Speaking of which, Packard parts chargers are available to keep the trucks up and running. Uh, so we do have Packard branded chargers fit uh, a range of applications and infrastructure plans. So as you can see, although the 220 EV, if we look at the bottom row there, could operate using a 20 or a 50 kilowatt hour charger, we really recommend 50 kilowatt hour as the minimum for daily operations on a class eight products. The 120 kilowatt hour option has been our most popular as it can not only charge one truck at 120 kilowatts, but also two at 60. So we can charge two class eight truck, uh, one class eight truck in three to four hours, or we can charge two class eight trucks still in the overnight period and allow for daily operation. Next slide, please. So as we're talking about chargers, it is important to remember how much electricity is flowing through your charge site. In a three hour charge, we're using about the same amount of electricity as 10 homes use in a day. So deploying EV in your fleet uh, is not as easy as plugging into a, a 110 or 220 wall outlet. We need real power and a lot of it. Next slide, please. So fortunately, Packard has partnered, has partnered with people to help. So Faith Technologies and Schneider Electric uh, can evaluate our site, provide a quote based on your current and your future needs and complete the project start to finish. So I mentioned future needs here because it's important to not just think about the truck you're deploying now because buying one truck is not too big an issue. But if you want to look at what your fleet looks like in five to 10 years, we want to dig the trench once, lay the conduit once, pour the concrete just once. So Faith has provided our customers, our customers site-specific quotes in as little as two weeks. So you can really get started as soon as you're ready. Next slide, please. And Peterbilt has a, a longstanding strong dealer network, which is available to all of our customers, including those buying electric vehicles. We have over 400 locations and there's several in the DFW area to provide any needed maintenance. Next slide, please. Although from customer feedback and some estimates on the EV design, as well as some information we've uh, received from the bus market on EVs, we really expect up to a 40% reduction overall in maintenance. There's no combustion engine, no fuel system, after treatment or death. So we expect 
this significant reduction in maintenance to play a large role in total cost of ownership for EVs moving forward. Next slide, please. So as we talk about total cost of ownership and the differences between electric and diesel, Peterbilt, uh, as Savannah was mentioned about their TCO calculator, Peterbilt also has our own TCO calculator on peterbilt.com. Next slide, please. So here you can enter your equipment costs, any offsetting grant funding, annual mileage, electric or diesel costs, and even driver and insurance expenses. Next slide, please. And then you can see the difference in total cost of ownership between the electric and diesel equivalents. So I can tell you that with funding available in DFW, Texas low electric costs and uh, negotiable rates, there are applications today where the total cost of operating an EV is less expensive than diesel. Next slide, please. That was a pretty quick overview of Peterbilt's EV models and the full partnership that Peterbilt offers. So we build the trucks. Um, I myself am, a, am dedicated to help customers find and secure funding and then pack our offers of DC fast chargers and our partnership with Faith Technologies and Cider Electric really assist in a seamless kickoff for electric vehicles that you're planning on deploying uh, now or in the future. So next slide. So just a reminder, our production facility and our division headquarters are right here in DFW in Denton. So if you'd like to discuss more about it or uh, you know, or visit the plant or drive one of the EVs, we'd love to have you out and, and have your organization visit. So I think we like we still have a few minutes. If anybody has any questions, I'd be glad to take those. Hey, good afternoon, Dusty. Hi, good afternoon. Hey, my name is Alan. I work with a company. We're called Good Faith Energy. We do uh, we do EV charging installations. I was wondering um, what it takes to become a partner, or is there any forms that we can fill out, or is there that go on your guys' website? You know, that would really be more of a a pack or uh, corporate purchasing type negotiation and RFP. So previously with Faith, uh, we did put out a request for proposals to. Uh, many infrastructure and construction companies across the U.S. and then really evaluated those for who we thought was a good fit and, and could offer a lot. So um, I would tell you if you are interested to contact PACAR, but okay. it, it's probably a you know a fairly lengthy and process and negotiations there right. the, because of the large scale of it. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate it. Sure. And I do see the question. Um, asking if our trucks will be at Electrify Expo in Austin, November 13th and 14th. You know, I'm, I'm not sure and, uh, and wasn't actually aware of the event, but I will mention that to our marketing team and our EV team and see if we can't get a truck down to Austin for that. We recently, uh, unfortunately, were not able to attend the, uh, the mayor's event that was in Austin. And so I'd, I'd like to get another truck down in that area. Dusty, this is Lori. I have a question. Um, sure. The, the statistic that you have on the, you know, three hours of charging is the equivalent of, of three houses. Is that, at, does that change based on power level? And if so, is that statistic based on 50 KW, 150 KW, 350? Could you elaborate there? Yeah, sure. So that, that's a really good point, right? I, that's really based on um, if we charge one time a day, then we would say it's call it 400 kilowatts in a day. And an average home, uh, I think my home in the summer months probably uses about 35 to 40 kilowatts a day. So that was based on charging one time a day. If we look at the amount in an hour, then we could say, you know, in a 24 hour period, a house using 35 kilowatt hours a day is probably using a little over one kilowatt an hour, maybe 1.3. And if we're charging the truck at 120 kilowatt hours, then we're really, uh, we're charging 120 homes or using the amount that 120 homes would use in that single hour. And maybe that's not qu quite 120, but uh, you know, in more mild times, it, it probably is that. And say running the AC all the time in the summer, then we're probably looking at 80 homes or so worth, but uh, it's, it's definitely significant.
and I'm really sorry. I think you may be breaking up a little bit, or um, or just speechless. I don't know. <laughs> Probably not. But if there's uh, something there that I can't hear, uh, I'd be glad to see it in the chat. But I appreciate the question, Lori. It's good. Oh, you answered it. Good. Thank you. Very welcome. One other question um, to the, the partnership that you've got with Schneider and Faith for those side assessments. Is that something where it works through y'all and everything kind of gets coordinated through Peterbilt or would they, you know, make arrangements separately with, with Schneider and with Faith and how, did, how does that work procedurally? Sure, yeah. So Faith, which has rebranded, I think, as InTech in the last few weeks, but uh, Faith is really the construction and project management company there, and Schneider is providing the hardware. So I would say from a uh, person standpoint, they'd be dealing with somebody from Faith, but oftentimes what we do is have a joint call with the customer where we can talk about trucks. Uh, we will have somebody from Pack Our Parts on the call who can talk at that same meeting about chargers and then somebody from Faith or Intech to talk uh, directly to them about infrastructure. And then they are able to, you know, uh, talk back and forth with Faith on their own, but we really try to, it's not a controlling standpoint where Peterbilt has to be involved, but between Faith and Packard Parts and Peterbilt, we do try to all be involved because what we want is a really seamless project where we deliver a truck and there's a running charger and you can plug in and use the truck. What we want to keep people from and hopefully help customers avoid is them purchasing a truck and not knowing where to go next. And then they end up with a truck delivered and no chargers to operate it. So they, they can reach out directly to Faith or we can introduce them to Faith and they can contact directly. But uh, you know we try to have one call where a customer can hear about all the different items they need to in one sitting as opposed to having to manage a project on their own. We still have a couple of minutes uh, for Dusty, if anyone has any questions. Uh, Dusty, you might want to put your contact info in the chat since uh, you don't seem to have that on the slide, so that'd be good. Sure, no problem. And uh, yeah, if anybody else has any other questions about that, you know, one thing I would leave you with is um, somebody mentioned it earlier, it was exactly right, that if you are looking to order an electric truck, I, I think that's wonderful and you should, but I would also uh, definitely suggest looking at infrastructure early on because it does need to be a hand-in-hand -hand project and it's, it's so important because of the lead times. Uh, everybody usually asks when I could deliver an electric truck and my answer is likely before you could get a charger set up. <laughs> so. Um, you know, it, and that's assuming we order soon, but I, I definitely want to help you uh, in both aspects of that so that we can have a successful deployment together. So I appreciate the time. And uh, if anybody has any questions, you're welcome to email me or call me. Great, thanks so much, Dusty. Uh, okay, Levi. Great, um, Dusty, thanks so much for uh, that wonderful presentation. So my name is Levi Lomlin. I'm a senior account executive with Ford Pro Charging. And I'll be taking you through some of the Ford products um, as uh, Ford has stepped into the electric vehicle space with uh, three new offerings. So next slide, please. Ford uh, really truly is leading the electric revolution um, and we're focused on serving needs in new and better ways and also from a fleet perspective. So with our EV offerings, a lot of things that we've tried to consider, you know, how to, how to keep vehicles more productive, uh, provide more uptime, uh, provide a vehicle at a price point that's going to really lower total cost of ownership for a fleet and really drive our goals of sustainability. Uh, right now, we have three total offerings in the market, uh, two that are more fleet focused. Next slide, please. And we're going to be touching on uh, those two vehicles today. So uh, the E-Transit um, is available 2022. Um, it's actually order bank on the E-Transit is open today. So it's available for order for fleets. And uh, production and delivery will actually occur um, in uh, December of 2021 and through 
all of next year. Uh, the 2022 F-150 Lightning Pro is uh, going to be available, or Order Bank will uh, be available in Q4 of this year. Production will start in 2022, and it'll be available late uh, in the model year of uh, 2022 for production standpoint. Next slide, please. We really focus on uh, uh, building vehicles that are purpose-built uh, for range. We've looked at a, a multi multitude of factors to be able to deliver a solution specifically geared toward fleets and their daily use. Uh, in terms of minimum TCO, we'll touch a little bit on some of the saving, savings that come with driving EVs and, um, and the Ford price points that are really driving down our total cost of ownership for our fleet customers. We'll talk about some of the productivity benefits and some of the uh, engineering capabilities that went into um, the, or some of the capabilities that were engineered into the, the Ford fleet products that really help uh, productivity on the job site as well as in the vehicle. And then we'll talk a little bit about some of the specs and price. Next slide, please. So uh, Ford has actually done several different studies um, related to the e-transit uh, that's out in the field today. And what we discovered is that uh, the average uh, cargo van drives about 76 miles per day. Um, now we understand that there's use cases out of that, but it allows to deliver a vehicle that's going to have 126 miles of range, well above that, that overall average uh, of per day driving for the cargo van. It's got a maximum targeted payload of 3,800 pounds. And Ford has tested our range at half payload. So all of our vehicles can comfortably go 126 miles at payload. We'll also be releasing a study in the near future uh, that talks about the impact on range at full payload capacity. Um, in the study that we've looked at, we analyzed over 30 million vehicles um, using you know, Ford's onboard modems and in, in telematics uh, to really narrow down uh, that 74 mile a day range on uh, the cargo van. Next slide, please. A few of the things that we found in looking at uh, driving down the total cost of ownership is that up to a 40% savings on scheduled maintenance was available. Obviously, there's no oil changes on, uh, on um, battery electric vehicles, which is a huge uh, benefit to, uh, to reducing your overall maintenance costs. Uh, there's up to a 50% savings on fueling expenses, obviously taking into account you know, when you're charging and avoiding uh, any type of on-demand charges or higher peak times for, for charging. Next slide, please. Great. Uh, so some of the things that were built into the productivity and, and opportunities are obviously no oil changes. So decreased downtime for scheduled maintenance uh, that you would have over ICE vehicles. Um, reduced powertrain noise, the use of um, the vehicle indoors since it doesn't have any emissions, uh, power anywhere. So by power anywhere, what we mean is that there's actually onboard charging for um, additional power tools or um, on use at the actual job site. You don't have to take any gas station trips since you'll be able to charge it directly from home. Um, it actually is available for a full charge overnight with just a 240 volt um, onboard charger and uh, zero emission powertrain. Next slide, please. So Ford has priced this vehicle starting at $43,295. With additional incentives, um, this, this vehicle really can be at a price point uh, below that $36,000 range for the fleet. So when you take that into consideration with a 40% reduction in maintenance and also a 50% reduction in the potential cost of fueling, this vehicle really does pencil out very aggressively for uh, our fleet customers. It's got over 126 miles of range uh, at the standard roof uh, configuration and over 3,800 pounds of payload. One of, one of the things that I think is really um, important to note is that Ford is actually able to engineer and manufacture this battery electric vehicle without impacting any of the cubic feet of car, uh, cargo space that's currently on the transit that you guys are using today. So if there's a standard upfit package that a company has used in order to um, complete their productivity or their daily job, there, there will be very minimal change or very minimal impact to the upfit um, just because of the way that the vehicle was engineered. We do provide an eight year, 100,000 mile warranty on all of our vehicles. 
related to battery electric vehicles, that is. And we warranty the battery up to 70% efficiency over that eight year or 100,000 mile mark. So it really does give our, our fleet clients the peace of mind to be able to step into a battery electric vehicle. Ford is really backing these vehicles up and we are, <coughs> excuse me, dedicated to providing an optimal battery electric vehicle experience for all of our fleet customers. It is designed for cab access, so we have improved the, the cab side of it, again, leaving the cargo side alone um, to ensure that any additional or, or any previous upfits that customers were working for would still be manageable in that cargo space, but it does have a wider walkthrough capability and it is class leading in load and height. Uh, the vehicle is available in all different roof heights, so the, the standard roof height uh, that you're probably most accustomed to seeing the medium roof height and the high roof, um, which has a full uh, ability to essentially walk into the back. Um, and it is also available in multiple different configurations from just a standard cargo van to a cutaway or a cab chassis. Uh, it is versatile for any jobs, has eight, eight total configurations as we had kind of just touched on with the roof height and the body length. And it's a vertically integrated solution. So Ford is really bringing a solution to market that integrates not only with its chargers, but also with its telematics and intelligence, allowing our fleet customers to see a 360 degree view of their charge operations, helping them to plan for the future and make more intelligent decisions as they continue to run their battery electric vehicles. Next slide, please. Next, we have the F-150 Lightning Pro. It's highly anticipated and Ford's actually had over 150,000 reservations for this particular truck. Uh, going into production early next year. Next slide, please. Uh, the Ford F-150 comes standard in a crew cab configuration with a 5.5 foot bed. It is standard four wheel drive. There's two motors that control both the uh, front wheels and the back wheels. And it's interesting to note that Ford has actually battle tested this vehicle in the same way that they test their internal combustion engine vehicles. We really wanted to be able to provide a fleet ready vehicle that can has all of the capabilities uh, that the Ford internal combustion engine uh, F-150 has for uh, clients, just give them that peace of mind that they're gonna be getting a Ford F-150 that can do everything that they expect the Ford F-150 to do. Obviously with electric vehicles, they're a little bit quieter. Uh, we do have a best in class front that we'll touch on in terms of the amount of space and power that's on board there. No oil changes that come with this F-150 since it is 100% electric. You can use it at indoors and available to charge at home. Next slide, please. The Ford F-150 Lightning is starting at $39,974 for a lower level trim model. This trim model does fall somewhere between the base model and uh, an XLT model. So kind of that mid-level trim for fleets. Um, and it does come with an onboard 12 inch um, human machine interface screen uh, that, uh, that allows you to tie into our entire charge network, our blue oval network that we'll touch on, as well as many other capabilities from a fleet perspective. Uh, the estimated EPA range is 230 miles standard and the available extended range will allow you up to 30, uh, 300 miles of range and will come standard with a um, wall mount 80 amp um, charger. Uh, it does have a best-in-class front, so we touched on on that. One of the huge benefits of not having um, an engine up front is that you do get additional space. So that front is 400 liters or 14.1 uh, cubic feet of space. It does come standard with up to 7.2 kilowatts of onboard power, so you can charge things like power tools on, on one trip uh, to the next um, house that you guys may be working out or the next construction site that you may be working at. And it's also complete with a drain plug. So that's great for things like just going to the, the college football game for a tailgate, you fill it up with ice and drain it out later. Or if you need to throw a pair of work boots in the front and wash them off um, or dirty tools in the front and wash them off, it does come with a, a drainable plug uh, to allow you to do that in the front of your truck. It's got a maximum available towing cap uh, capability of 10,000 pounds and a targeted max payload of 2,000 pounds. Again, all of the range testing was done at half the payload capacity. Uh, so it really should give our clients peace of mind when thinking about uh, stepping into this battery electric offering, knowing that it'll be able to handle every job that they throw at it. 
Again, this vehicle is backed up with a 100,000 mile warranty um, for eight years or 100,000 miles, and that's up to 70% of the battery um, efficiency. Next slide, please. Ford has really worked out to build out their service network as well. So we have 2,200 electric vehicle certified dealers, including 600 commercial vehicle centers across the US that will be EV certif certified. Uh, in the long haul, we are gonna be providing a vertically integrated solution, similar to what um, Dusty went through with Peterbilt. So we'll be able to deliver chargers for our clients, vehicles for our clients, and telematics for our clients. One thing that we'll be able to add is essentially a dealer service network that has the ability to do service electric, uh, electric vehicle infrastructure. So your chargers, um, and they will be essentially uh, housed at dealers. So anywhere you're within earshot of a Ford dealer, you'll have a technician that would be able to work on your actual charging infrastructure. Uh, next slide, please. As mentioned, our, our vehicles are vertically integrated with both our telematics and our charge solution. So um, you come standard with any uh, fleet purchase of a Ford F-150 or E-Transit, you get three years of complimentary service um, of our Ford telematics. And what this does is it allows you to see, again, uh, more in depth on what's happening with your chargers, uh, whether there's an interrupted charge or uh, where the energy is coming from. Uh, the, the onboard modem in telematics actually has the ability to identify if a different electric vehicle has been plugged in, say a Tesla or some other OEM maker model, and can roll up uh, the cost of energy into one specific billing center that would allow fleets and businesses to reimburse for the cost of energy uh, in customers' homes. You can set range statuses and set thresholds and, and alerts. Um, if a vehicle falls below a certain range, to identify um, either fleet managers or uh, the fleet driver itself. Uh, it'll tell you the plug-in status, so letting you know that your charge is continuing or whether or not it'll be interrupted. And then uh, it does provide you with charge logs. Next slide, please. I wanna talk a little bit about our charging solutions. So Ford has kind of dropped this into three buckets, both home, public, and depot. And uh, we have brought a solution that's full scale and integratable in each of these offerings, understanding that both fleets will have home charging and centralized fleet charging with public overlap. Next slide, please. Ford, uh, the Ford vehicles do have um, two chargers that are available today. So um, any e-transit comes standard with the onboard mobile charger. So it includes a 20 foot cord and it could be plugged into just a regular 240 volt um, outlet. So the same that you would use for your driver the, or your dryer, the primary use case is for an overnight charge. And it does have the ability to charge uh, the e-transit zero, uh, zero to 85% in a total of 11 hours. So you can get a full night's charge um, through just a, a standard wall outlet. If you prefer a direct wire option, we do have a 240 volt connector uh, with up to a 20 foot cord as well. Uh, this comes standard in a 48 amp. The F-150 would run, uh, the standard range F-150 would run on a 48 amp charger. Uh, the uh, extended range F-150 has the capability to move all the way up to an 80 amp charger uh, for a, quick, a quicker charge. Next slide, please. Ford has also added what we call the Blue Oval Network. And what this is, is a collection of both EV Shell Green Lots locations, as well as Electrify America. So we have over 63,000 charge plugs available. Over 6,000 of those will be DC fast. Uh, we have the ability uh, to essentially activate a charger without an app or a card that requires RFID. It can be activated right through the human machine interface that is available on every e-transit or F-150 comes standard in that 12 inch screen. So if you're a fleet, you can essentially cover all of your billing costs for energy, whether it's through the home, public charging or your depot application. Next slide, please. So thank you guys for uh, listening in on, on what Ford has coming down the pike. It's super interesting. And uh, I hope that you guys enjoyed it as much as I hope I enjoyed presenting. Are there any questions? Levi, you had a question in the chat um, from Teresa. Will the F-150 be available with an eight-foot bed? Great question, Teresa. Um, I believe that it will, um, it's my understanding. But uh, for right now, in the first generation uh, F-150, we're going to be focused on all crew cab, 
all four wheel drive and just the 5.5 foot bed configuration, that may be something that Ford's gonna consider on down the road, but it won't be available in the 2022 model. Any other questions for Levi? Okay, uh, it's four o'clock, we, we really, oh, go ahead, Lori, sorry. Sorry, I was just gonna say, I, I wanted to understand a little bit more about that blue oval network. So are you, are you building out your own network of chargers or is this a partnership with the networks that are already on the ground? Lori, this is a partnership with the networks that are already on the ground. Uh, okay. Ford will have an, a, uh, an offering for hardware and software to help control fleets and, or to help control chargers in series. Um, and that will be part of our, our charging strategy. Um, but what we're doing is we're, we're helping fleets essentially put chargers in homes or in a, a centralized location. But for public charging, uh, we're, we're not planning on having any consumer focused charging at this time. We're relying on existing networks for a public charging strategy. I have a quick question about um, if the air conditioner is used on the vans for the whole day, how much that would affect the range? Yeah, great question, Matt. Um, I don't have the exact number. Um, I know that Ford is going to be producing a study in the coming months that's going to show the impacts of payload on range, as well as um, air conditioning use, as well as, um, uh, inter uh, I guess, temperate um, temperatures and, and how that impacts the overall range on both the standard um, standard range um, F-150 and the standard range E-Transit as well as the extended range F-150. So more on that to come, but nothing that's been publicly disclosed as of yet. All right, thank you. In the chat, um, do you already have a telematic solution in place? Um, and then will the system integrate? Great question, Tim. So yeah, if you already have a telematic solution in place, um, you're welcome to continue to use that telematic solution. It shouldn't impede uh, any of the Ford Pro intelligence um, that, uh, that's available to you. So uh, if you do have your own telematics um, solution and you're happy with them and you wanna stay with them, we can either flow data through them, um, through our data services, or um, you can just use them kind of in tandem to look at the, the different uh, aspects of, of the intelligence um, you would still get some some readings from I'm sure your your regular telematics provider, uh, but obviously a vertically integrated integrated solution that Ford's going to be bringing to the table has is a little more robust and is probably going to be able to provide a little bit more information since we're getting that direct. Okay, well, thank you, Levi. I think we're going to need to move on to the next presenter. But sure. uh, folks, if you still have questions, put them in the chat, and maybe Levi can answer your questions there. Great, thank you guys so much. Thank you. Okay, uh, Larry Bracefield. Hey, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for having me. And uh, before I kick off, I just wanna say um, great presentations thus far. And while we have different nameplates and OEMs represented, I think I can speak to the others and saying we all share one common vision, which is changing the industry and ultimately changing our world so it's exciting to be part of that. Uh, my name is Larry Brassfield. I'm regional sales manager for Lion Electric. Um, you can see that I did not change the date on my cover slide. Apologize for that. I did brush it up just the other day. Uh, but I do like to say we are more than just an OEM. We like to say that we are a technology company focused on electric vehicles. Next slide, please. A little history about Lion, if you're not familiar with us. We actually started business all the way back in 2008 when we were founded by our president and co-founder, Mark Bedard. He came from the bus industry and his co-founder came from bus operations, bus manufacturing. They came together uh, with a common vision of making things better. They said, if we're gonna be different, we have to be better. With that, they actually decided to redo the roof configuration manufacturing process eliminated thousands of rivets along the roof line of the bus, uh, which were the source of leaks, corrosion, expense, and downtime. Uh, but ultimately we knew that we wanted to have an alternative to a diesel combustion engine as far as power. 
We looked at uh, natural gas, looked at propane, ultimately centered in on EV as the solution. And in 2016, delivered our first pure electric school bus. Uh, I talk about all this bus heritage because really we like to say, you take the yellow part off of the bus and you've really got a long wheelbase truck chassis there. So we did introduce a, a mini bus on the transit side in 2018. Uh, but it was a real natural evolution and, and progress or, or step for us to go ahead and launch the truck division back in 2020. I'm proud to say that I am employee number 29 in the truck group and I've been with Lion Electric for over a year and a half now. Um, I'll get a little bit more into uh, our electric vehicles as we go to the next slide. Currently today, we've got over 400 vehicles in operation with that have accumulated over 9 million zero emission miles. Uh, we are headquartered in St. Jerome, province of Quebec, about 30 miles northwest of Montreal. Uh, currently, we have uh, capacity for 2,500 pure electric buses and trucks in St. Jerome, uh, but we're really excited as uh, a little over four months ago, we went public on May 7th. And on that same day, we also announced uh, our expansion into the US with the acquisition of a property in the greater Chicagoland area. This will be the largest solely focused EV manufacturing facility in North America. And we'll have up to 20,000 vehicles per year capacity. So great room for growth, really looking forward to it and actually looking forward to vehicles rolling off the line in Joliet, Illinois, about a year from now. Uh, we also, earlier in the spring, did announce our own battery assembly plant, which will be functional later next year. Really excited about that, what it's gonna be able to do for us uh, on every level of the manufacturing side. Uh, we currently have eight experience centers, two research and development centers with capacity and plans to further expand those uh, as you will see here. Next slide. As a direct selling OEM, we call our brick and mortar service support experience centers. You can see listed on the left and shaded in the darker blue on the map. And then on the right, uh, shaded in gray on the map, uh, those that are coming in, in part of our expansion plan. The experience service centers are certainly gonna have technicians, mobile service, uh, parts, charging, but also a capacity and focus for training. We wanna be able to train operators. We wanna train technicians. We also wanna be able to train uh, first responders in the area. So we will really have that focus. We also want to expand that into someday hosting Clean Cities Coalition events at our experience centers. And you can see we do have uh, Texas highlighted where it's going to be and when that's going to get uh, under construction or uh, under acquisition is really going to be determined by uh, probably a, a couple big lead customers. Next slide, please. So the roadmap of how we've got to where we're at today, currently uh, we do have Alliance 6 cabin chassis uh, available in production. In fact, uh, we've got a very aggressive four or five month lead time on a chassis on a class six, 26,000 pound GVW air brake chassis. Uh, we also have a tandem axle class eight truck chassis, 20 front, 40 rear uh, truck chassis. And you also see a utility truck noted there. The Lion 8 Refuse is a truck we're really excited about because I am convinced there is no tougher application for a truck than a refuse truck. I'm a runner and I tell people, you know, for a refuse truck, that's like sprinting 200 yards at a time and doing a marathon. And you can stop and do, do push-ups every couple hundred yards. There's no rougher application uh, for a vehicle than that refuse. And EV is a great fit for it. I'm going to talk a little bit more about that. Uh, we are currently going into production right now with our Lion 8 day cab. You'll see that closer in an upcoming slide. Uh, we also do have a bucket truck configuration 
Uh, we're also working with all the body and the reefer OEMs to uh, work to get their body and reefers integrated with our chassis. Very excited about the refrigerated truck market. And then looking into next year, we've got both a class five and a class seven truck chassis coming in addition to a boom truck. Next slide. Unlike some of the others, we do not have a diesel or a natural gas legacy as we look at it to weigh us down. We are solely focused on EV. We were born to be electric. Uh, we do not do retrofits or remands. We build it from the ground up with the sole focus on EV. Uh, I mentioned that learning that we had with that bus roof, we incorporated that into our own cab construction. So we've got some of the same benefits that go there. We currently have more kilowatt available uh, in our product offerings uh, than any other OEM. I mentioned the composite cab. It's gonna eliminate the rust, the corrosion, uh, downtime and things that come with it. Uh, all of our vehicles have regen braking. Uh, one of the previous presenters talked about uh, refuse being a great application for regen braking. Couldn't agree more. Uh, it, it's certainly significant and one of the first things that drivers will recognize, whether you're in a car or a truck, regen braking is significant. It, stop, it cuts your stopping distance almost in half and it extends your brake, brake life up to almost three times as long. Um, one other note, you know, we've, you've heard it before, there's some consistent things with EVs, one of which is the big maintenance reduction. Well, if you just look there down at the, uh, the center left, electric motors have 20 parts. Only three of those are moving. The rest are coils and magnets as compared to up to 2000 parts in a diesel engine. All those things and that simplicity do correlate into um, maintenance reduction and downtime reduction as well. Next slide. So jumping into our product line, go to the next slide, please. You can see uh, I've got highlighted uh, our three main uh, vehicles here between the Lion 6 and 8 truck chassis, as I mentioned before, uh, the day cab tractor. Uh, and in fact, these, uh, these, kilo, these mileage ranges are going up. We're, we're actually seeing up to 200 on the 6 up to 180 on the eight and that 260 in our day cab with the 653 kilowatt uh, offering is best in class as we see it today. Similar to some of the others, we do take a modular battery pack approach. If you have a lower mileage range, uh, understanding that the batteries are gonna be the most expensive and the heaviest component of the vehicle, we can go to a lesser battery pack offering that's better suited for your operation. Next slide. Ultimately, we look at our chassis as truly a platform to put uh, the various bodies on. We like to consider ourselves to be master integrators. The Lion 8 Refuse is a great example of that. We partnered with a company out of Canada called Boyvin Evolution. A lot, of, a lot of people haven't heard of Boyvin, but when we tell them that the president and founder, Claude Boyvin, was the president, founder, and proprietor of Labrie, uh, a very well-known body manufacturer in the refuse industry, they get great credibility. The, uh, the BEV automatic side loader that we are currently specking and selling, that is the industry's first pure electric body on a pure electric chassis. Uh, we've eliminated all the hydraulics except for two cylinders at the rear for discharge at the end of the day. Uh, really, really slick truck offering best in class as far as TCOs are concerned and maintenance reductions are, are considered. Um, so whether you're looking at a reefer, a bucket, a boom, we work with those body manufacturers to integrate their body onto our chassis. Next slide, please. So you look at the bucket truck. I, in fact, my director of sales is out at the utility uh, truck expo out in Louisville right now. Uh, we've partnered with Posi Plus. We are also talking to all the other major uh, bucket aerial lift OEMs. Um, some vocations where this will make sense are obviously the utilities, uh, the communications uh, industries, tree trimmers, constructions, etc. Next slide. 
as I work with end users, uh, they talk about a desire to electrify their fleets. The first and most important thing I can do is make sure that it fits because right now we all have our own limitations and I, I need to understand payload, duty cycle and charge times available. Uh, also the range requirements. Those are really the biggest things, you know, how far on a single charge, how long to recharge, what's your payload, how much time to recharge, what's that gonna take? From there, it's no, it's no surprise to many that EVs cost more. You're buying 10 years of energy, if not more, up front with the vehicle. That's where you really need to look at the TCO perspective. With that, we do have a grant team where we help uncover uh, funding opportunities uh, where and whenever possible, we will help our customers apply for those grants. And then after that, customers say, well, wait, how are we going to get it all charged? And like the others uh, have mentioned before, we're not just going to sell you a truck and say, here you go, figure it out. No, uh, we work very closely with you at your site level, find out who's your utility provider. And we actually are certified resellers of nine different charging cabinets. We don't have any proprietary charging, nor will we ever. And we do have a great abundance of options that we can quote to get you the right solutions for your fleet. And then ultimately, I mentioned training and our focus at our experience centers. We need to train you and your fleets, your operators, your maintenance techs, uh, your managers, dispatch personnel, everybody that's gonna be looking at the telematics and, and the performance and the operations we want to support you in every aspect possible so you can take that truck, integrate it, and put it, to, put it to use. Next slide. Here's my contact information. Uh, feel free to reach out to me directly. And if anybody has any questions, please let me know. Any questions for Larry, uh, feel free to unmute yourself and ask a question or put it in the chat. With that, we'll, let's keep her moving. Thank you. Thanks, Larry. Uh, next up, we have Andre with Exos. Good afternoon, everyone. Hope, can, you, uh, can you hear me okay, Ms. Amy? Yes, sounds great. Well, I'm going to keep my camera off just because I've seen some of the other presenters have some uh, connection issues just to try to make it easier on the Zoom. Um, but um, I should say good afternoon, everyone. Hope everyone's having a good Wednesday afternoon. Uh, my name is Andre Fuller. I'm uh, accompanied and joined by Karen Jackson. Uh, you can definitely leave any questions that you may have in the chat and uh, she can easily get answers to you. Uh, but we're coming to you from Exos Trucks, uh, electric commercial vehicle company specializing in class five through class eight vehicles. We are truly a company that is obsessed with making fleets more efficient and, of course, saving fleet owners money. Uh, our company founders, uh, Dakota Simler and Gio Sardani, were actually fleet owners and fleet operators. So when they founded this company and started creating trucks, of course, they created trucks with all the issues and problems that many fleet owners face every day. And of course, proceeded to find ways to eliminate those issues. Um, you can go to the next slide, please, Ms. Amy. Um, one, I wanna start off with manufacturing. Uh, of course, we are based out of Los, An Los Angeles, California. Can you go to the next slide, please? Uh, and as you see that, that is the green dot over there on the West Coast in California. Now, uh, I'll put this slide on here to show you that uh, a lot of customers, especially in our central regions, uh, they say, well, you're in California. We are in California. Our HQ is in California. But as you see, we have many flex site locations across the country. This is, of course, to help accommodate all our customers uh, in North America. We do have customers in uh, Canada and, and Mexico. Um, and then also, uh, we have recently gone public as a company, and um, you can definitely find us on NASDAQ if you're interested, but um, bring that up because we definitely are scaling our company up. So this picture or this uh, presentation was made uh, before we went public. So there definitely will be more flex site locations uh, going up here in the near, near future. Next slide, please. Uh, here are our global su uh, supply chain partners. 
uh, just basically letting you know uh, all the parts and uh, tier one suppliers that we use to bring you truly a complete, dependable and reliable step band. Uh, many of these suppliers uh, that are probably familiar to most of the people in the Zoom, uh, like Hendrickson, Dana, um, Bosch, uh, and then of course, Morgan Olson for our bodies. Uh, LG, of course, helps with our batteries, but uh, basically letting you know that uh, once again, more assurance, letting you know that all of our parts are coming from tier one suppliers. And if worst case scenario, something were to go wrong, there wouldn't be a long turnaround time on your, uh, on that part, whatever the case may be. Uh, next slide, please. And then this takes us into uh, uh, probably the nuts and bolts of our company and of our vehicles. Next slide, please. Our technology. So first up, uh, what we like to call in-house first of our big three would be our modular chassis platform. Um, like some people have alluded to, we build our chassis with EVs in mind from scratch, from the ground up. Our chassis is so is truly proprietary to us. And once again, that helps us, uh, you know, service batteries, make improvements, uh, any new bells and whistles that, that will be coming to our electric vehicles here in the near future. That of course makes it easier for us. And then the other thing uh, that it allows us to do uh, we're not just a, a truck company that, uh, you know, hey, you buy a truck from us, we give you the truck, leave the truck, bye-bye. That's not us. We are a service. So we, when you come to us, we're basically consulting and figuring out what your business needs, what chassis size and configurations would fit your business the best. And like I said, being that we build our chassis from the ground up, we basically can make anything that you need to fit into your business model which is really good and compared to uh, some people may have option A, option B, option C, and those are the only options they have. And they basically force you in a corner and you know, you don't have any room, any wiggle room to try to make it more so fit your business specifically. Uh, so definitely a good edge for us there. Next uh, slide, please. Uh, and then this would take me into number two of our big three, our battery. Now, of course, uh, the battery has many complex and intricate components within it. Um, there'll be information at the end of the presentation where uh, you can, uh, we can exchange information and uh, we can definitely set up another call to uh, dive into some of those more intricate components. But being that we're on a, a time frame and kind of uh, restrictions, I'll just hit on a couple of the few points and those points will uh, fall in line with safety. Uh, one of the big features that separates our battery from others is definitely the safety. Uh, one of the safety features is the forced uh, active air cooling. Our, we actually use a, a Freon system that uses, uh, forces air to cool that battery. Of course, electricity, of course, creates heat. So you definitely have to have a way to cool that battery. Uh, whereas some of our, some of the comparisons uh, may use a liquid coolant, uh, which is can be more susceptible to being flammable. So basically, that's how one way that we make our battery safer. Another way that I would like to touch on is uh, our two cell resistant impact protection system. Uh, so basically, uh, in brief, uh, if something were to go wrong with part of the battery, there's a uh, fail safe system input in that battery to prevent that problem from spreading throughout the rest of the battery. Um, which is also very good. So um, that way you're not completely damaging your entire battery. And that way, if it is a small issue, we can definitely get that serviced and fixed for you. Um, next slide, please. And then number three of our big three, our technology. Uh, as soon as you step in our step band, you'll definitely feel and realize the, the advanced technology that we have within our step band uh, as far as a driver standpoint. But there is also technology for the fleet owner, I should say, with our vehicle telematics. Uh, this, of course, helps you manage your fleet, uh, know the charging uh, on each vehicle. That way you can make uh, decisions logistically uh, just as far as what trucks need to go where, routes, things of that nature. Um, another technology feature of our, of our trucks are, is intelligent charging. So uh, there were some mentions on uh, kilowatt our rates uh, for different um, whatevers, uh, trucks, houses, what, uh, we dis discussed a few different things uh, along this webinar, uh, but basically our intelligent charging gets you the best charging rate available. So 
once again, you can definitely uh, get my information at the end of the slide and we can go more in depth on that. But basically, there are different charging uh, rates throughout the day and our trucks make sure that you're getting the cheapest charging rate available at all times. Um, also, our predictive maintenance. Um, our trucks have systems in place where they will let you know uh, when maintenance uh, things are coming up before they actually, you know, arrive in our, our uh, you know, need to be taken care of at that time. So now you can make your plans ahead of time uh, and make arrangements ahead of time. And that way you're not being surprised uh, so much. And, you know, like I said, can make plans ahead of time. And then also the new feature, uh, it's not on here, but we're actually able to remotely update our vehicles. So anytime there's a uh, new update for whatever the case may be, uh, you don't have to bring the vehicle in to one of our actual uh, flex flight locations or anything like that. We can actually remotely maintenance or remotely update that vehicle. Uh, next slide, please. And this will take us into our vehicle platform, our lineup. Uh, I know all the previous slides were basically uh, informing you and teaching you about basically the, uh, the insides of our trucks. This will essentially give you a brief overview of the outside because all of our big three that I just mentioned are in all of our vehicles across the board. Next slide, please. Uh, as I mentioned at the beginning of the slide, we do specialize in class five through class eight vehicles. Uh, being once again that our chassis is built from the ground up, that is definitely what allows us to do uh, have such a wide range of uh, vehicle lineups. Um, as you see at the top, once again, just a brief overview. If you need any uh, information on specific vehicles, like I said, uh, there will be information at the end of the presentation where we can definitely set up a call and uh, get you all the information, brochures, things like that that you may need. Um, but as you see at the top, there's a brief overview of our, our class five through six. Uh, you got your step van, some box trucks, and then of course on the bottom, those are your bigger vehicles which your class seven through class eight. Um, next slide, please. Now this is just a, uh, an example, just to kind of show you how our vehicles can fit into your business. Uh, right here for this example, we're gonna use one of our uh, partners and relations uh, that we have with FedEx. Um, one of the a few of the reasons that our vehicles fit so well with FedEx, uh, predictable routes and return to base. Uh, those two go hand in hand. One, because you don't want, of course, you don't want an electric vehicle, especially while charging infrastructure isn't as, uh, you know, relevant as we would like it to be, uh, which it will be in the near, near future. But as of right now, today, you don't want to be worried about um, if your vehicle is going to make it, if this has enough range on the battery. Uh, and then also that return to base that is where you would charge a vehicle. So being that that vehicle always returns to base, you'll always have an efficient way to charge that vehicle and keep it ready to go. Uh, the less than 200 daily miles, once again, that's how it fits into FedEx's business. Uh, most of the routes don't go over 200 miles. So uh, our step van and some of our battery configurations that offer less than 200 miles, of course, fit directly into their business model. Uh, you can go next, please. Uh, this is just to give you a brief overview of some of the specs, basically letting you know. Uh, now, this is just standard uh, 178 inch. We do have a variation of uh, wheelbases going from 158 all the way up to 208. And then same thing with the box size. And then, of course, just once again, just letting you know that the cubic space is the full cubic space. So um, our batteries don't take away from the cubic space, uh, which is definitely a good addition. Um, and then, of course, we have many different range configurations on our batteries. This is just, again, a standard spec. Next, please. Uh, here are some features that go along with the standard spec, just to kind of let you know what you will be getting uh, with our vehicle. Of course, the first bullet is uh, specific to the step van, uh, being that, you know, of course, a bigger vehicle could easily easily have a higher uh, zero to 30 miles per hour time but every other bullet on this slide is applicable to every single vehicle that we have on our lineup uh regenerative braking has been brought up a few times uh regenerative braking uh definitely for us we're basically using science to our advantage uh energy is neither transferred nor i mean energy is neither created nor destroyed only transferred so basically uh we're recuperating the energy from the inertial motion of the vehicle and that, of course, in turn, makes 
the, um, the vehicle more efficient, uh, makes it easier to operate for stop and go traffic settings, which a lot of our uh, FedEx, UPS, uh, anybody in that last mile delivery setting definitely, especially in a, a urban area, definitely has to deal with. So a lot of our contractors like that. And then of course, it lessens the stress on the brake pads, which have definitely been known to be a, uh, a constant maintenance expense, right? Um, and then also some of the other bullets on here, level three DC charging, uh, which all our vehicles are capable of level two or level three fast charging, uh, like to definitely definitely have that versatility there. Uh, the heel hold and then the one pedal drive at low speed is, goes hand in hand uh, with the regenerative braking. And then of course, lane keeping and collision avoidance. And, um, and then of course we have many other features that, uh, that just aren't on this slide. Some of those would be like 360 cam, uh, front sensors, things like that. Uh, next slide, please. And then here's some actual pictures of our vehicles, uh, just kind of just to give you a brief overview and uh, just let you know that we do actually have vehicles on the road, uh, even though um, you know some of our clients in the central region may not see them just yet. Once again, we are based in LA, California, but they are on the way, being that we have many, many orders in the central region already being placed. Um, but top left will be our ET1. That's our, of course, one of our bigger uh, applications that has also been uh, seen and mentioned on Forbes magazine. Uh, we have our truck with Loomis uh, Armored Trucks. Uh, the partnership with them has been really good. Of course, so we have our truck with UPS through our partnership with them. And then the bottom left, we haven't really mentioned it, but I wanted to put it on here anyways, just in case uh, some of you guys may know uh, somebody that's in the uh, forklift powertrain space. We also do uh, offer, you know, battery packs and applications for uh, things of that in that nature as well. Um, next slide, please. And vehicle charging. Uh, we can go to the next slide. We already kind of touched on this. Like I said, level two charging, level three charging is available for all our vehicles. Uh, definitely want to have a versatility there because you just never know. Uh, different fleet owners may have different uh, charge times that they need uh, to fit their business. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, and this is just a, um, probably my favorite uh, milestone of our company, our, our our, our new segment of our company, our Exos Energy Solutions. Uh, like I was saying, Exos isn't just a, a uh, truck company where you buy a truck from us, we give you the truck and hey, thank you, bye-bye. Uh, we're a full complete service on the transition to uh, EVs, uh, electric vehicles, and also installing charging infrastructure. Uh, so even though you may not have actual charging infrastructure in place uh, at your site, we have ways to basically get over that hurdle and provide charging to you if you were trying to have a, you know, electric vehicle today, so to speak. Um, and once again, uh, we can definitely dive into that. I just put a picture on here. We can definitely dive into that on a separate call and uh, let you know uh, more of the uh, intricate details of our Exo Hub and, of course, of our entire Exos Energy Solution segment. Um, next slide, please. I think that will be it. So. This is uh, the QR code. Uh, like I said, this is the, uh, the slide. Whereas if you um, need any more information, would like some brochures or uh, any material about any of our uh, vehicles, class five or cl through class eight, uh, you can easily scan this QR code. It'll take you to a Google form and it'll have you fill out um, just simple information like email, phone number. So that way we can get back in contact with you. And of course, have an idea of what we need to come back uh, with you when we do contact you. Um, but that uh, definitely concludes my presentation. Uh, that's just a brief overview of Exos trucks uh, in general. And then of course, a brief overview of uh, all the vehicles and applications that we have to offer. Uh, like, I, like I said, definitely um, feel free to scan that QR code and uh, fill out that information. And we can definitely have more in-depth conversations about uh, whichever vehicles we have that may fit your business uh, in the near future. But definitely would love to uh, open the floor for questions if there are any. Are there any in the chat? Any questions for Andre? And also feel free to use the chat.
Um, as we wrap up, I just wanted to remind everyone we will post the um, slide deck and the recording on our um, Dallas Fort Worth Clean Cities uh, webpage. Lori has uh, a question in the chat. A recommended ratio. So I wouldn't, I don't, is there a recommended ratio of charges for vehicles with fleet applications? So uh, to answer that question for, from an uh, EXO truck standpoint, um, if that's kind of in relation to the, the EXO hub, the picture that I mentioned, the EXO hub has the ability to charge five vehicles at once. Uh, the picture actually showed three docks on one side and there's two docks on the, uh, the uh, other side. Um, that is essentially a, uh, a big mobile battery that of course is driven in on an 18 wheeler trailer. Uh, and the, being that it is mobile, uh, is able to, you know, be placed depending on wherever your site best, uh, you know, fits, wherever it best fits at your site. Um, once again, like I said, as you see, the three docks on one side, there are two other docks on the other side, and they all, the EXO hub comes with DC fast charging. So that's all one hour, one hour and some change uh, on your charging time. So um, I hope that gives you some insight, or I hope that answers your question at least somewhat. So Andre, that is not grid connected, it looks like. It's a self-contained unit. Is that accurate? So you would you would plug, tie into the grid. You would plug the X hub XO hub into wherever your central power grid was. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Lori, I'd like to respond, you know, and honestly, don't want to sound like a politician, but it depends. Every customer and scenario is different. I talked about it, you know, as far as understanding, you know, customers' needs uh, as they look to electrify. One of the previous presenters talked about a 124 kilowatt charge cabinet that's got dual 60 kilowatt uh, EVSEs coming off of it. We see a lot of people doing that. On the other hand, for the refuse application, where it's a slower fill over you know, typically that would be a one for one. So it's going to vary on, you know, what's available, what their operation needs are, and what's there on the utility supply. So hopefully that helps. Well, if there are no more questions, uh, I guess we will conclude. Uh, thank you to all our presenters and thank you all, um, all the attendees for uh, participating. It's been a pleasure. Thanks, Thanks for everybody. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Thank you. Thank you all.